Hey, welcome back, everybody. Jeff Frick here with the Cube. We're in our Palo Alto studio today for a Cube conversation, and we're excited to have from Druva, a very hot company in the storage space, Dave Packer, the VP of Corporate and Product Marketing from Druva. Welcome, Dave. Thank you. It's great to be here, Jeff. Absolutely. Appreciate it. So last week, I'm sure you were there. We were there at AWS reInvent. Right. What'd you think? Oh, it was a great event, uh, especially you know for Druva. It was uh, you know one of these events where. Um, you know, we came out uh, as one of uh, you know the top storage vendors for AWS. Um, there was a during their uh, keynote, they showed a bunch of categories around storage vendors. We were in two of them in the top five. Um, and another thing was uh, is when we announced our AWS Marketplace uh, introduction of our uh, Phoenix product line, which focuses in on server data. Um, and so that was big as we were one of 11 vendors that AWS picked uh, to be part of that program. Uh, and uh, what it does is allows organizations to actually go directly to the marketplace, purchase our product, use it, uh, and uh, basically on a regular basis, uh, you know, renew or do whatever they want to do. So it's actually, it's a new way of doing it. It's really exciting, actually. Okay, well, let's let's back up a couple steps for people that aren't as familiar with Druva. Yeah, sure. A little bit the history of the company. So you guys are, your uh, storage, uh, cloud storage and backup and replication, security. Give us kind of, right. the, kind of the 411. Yeah, so, you know, we characterize Druva as being cloud information management. Okay. You know, ultimately, you know, we were founded in 2008. Our focus has really been on, you know, how do you help businesses, especially today, where data has become such, so much, much more fragmented and dispersed. Right. Um, how do you enable a business to still have the visibility, the accessibility, the availability of their data? Right. So, uh, you know, when you think about it, organizations are faced with, you know, end users on laptops. They're using cloud services. They're using mobile devices. You have servers. Um, you just have data going everywhere. But as a business, you're still required to kind of be the steward of your data. Right. 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 Especially sensitive information, financials, health. Care. Those pesky words yeah, like yeah, governance, yeah, exactly, compliance, right. those types of things, right? Exactly, right? I'll come into play still, right? And so, you know, the legacy models, which were really designed to be on premises and try to address those things, kind of have fallen short because of the way data has changed so much in the last five years, kind of where it's located and everything. So, as Druv has matured as a company, our focus has really been to help businesses and enterprises get that visibility, that manageability over the data in a way that they can kind of bring that all together and get a holistic view on a worldwide global basis if necessary. Right, and you guys took a kind of a cloud approach early on. You kind of saw the right. benefits of doing that versus kind of the traditional way. Right, so you know, we, we're really fortunate because being founded in 2008 gave us a huge advantage, uh, which was cloud was just becoming something at right. that point in time. Uh, which, you know, from an, our CTO's office point of view was, you know, this is something we need to grab onto and run with. And uh, we had the foresight to see that this was going to be a, a huge market opportunity. Um, and so we developed to be 100% cloud native, right? And so what that means is at the end of the day, we can provide businesses not only kind of a global reach into, for their data centers and where they want their data and how they want to manage, manage it, because there's a lot of data regulations out there today that require maybe data to be in Germany or data to be in the UK or right, the US. Right. And so we want to make sure that companies can adhere to of those but also it gives us a, a form of elasticity and capacity that's unmatched by anything you could do on premises and I, i'll give you a case in point is one of the big challenges especially when you start talking about compliance and you start talking about governance and legal data handling one of the big issues companies have had in the past is they've depended on systems that require them to build a ton of infrastructure to support. Right. They didn't understand really what it would take to make it happen. Uh, they wound up babysitting it a lot. And so the cost just skyrocketed. In the cloud, you can kind of like take that off the table completely, right? right? And right. the elasticity is there so you can get things like real-time indexing of data things that you wouldn't be able, it took months before to do right. on-premises. And so, you know, we've been able to bring these to bear so companies can have these different ways of managing information all on a single data set, which when you really think about it, in the old world, I'd have a data set for my archive, I'd have a data set for my backup, I'd have a data set for my governance capabilities, for my search. We merge that all together, single data set, no replication, all in the cloud. Interesting. So I, I think a big thing that came out of the reInvent show was, mm -hmm. was a couple of people said so it's kind of AWS 2.0. That clearly enterprises have right. bought into the vision. We saw right. Andy Jassy and Pat Gelsinger on stage together earlier this year talking about a partnership. So clearly 
um, enterprises are they're now they they get it right. Right. I'm curious. Your perspective is kind of the one of the early knocks on cloud was the whole security conversation, right? And how that's evolved over time from your early days where it was probably a big sales objection that you had to overcome to now, in fact, one might argue that it's actually more secure to be in a third party cloud. Yeah, it's it's an excellent it's an excellent <laughs> point because I'd agree. Uh, you know, three, four years ago, uh, when I first started with a company, I actually took on enterprise security as kind of one of the areas I was managing uh, to help the kind of our sales team. Uh, and it was a big issue. Uh, and it was one of these things where the conversation always came back to security, my data is more secure right. on premises. Right. <laughs> uh, but, you know, there's two, I'd say there's two things that have evolved. One is, um, and I'll make a couple of points on this, is, you know, one is that, 99% of the largest breaches in the last three years have been all on-premises systems, right? And you know you can go back to something like Sony, which was like two years ago, and see one of the things that I challenges I you know I talk about is kind of like the M and M problem, right? Where companies have invested really heavily in security at the perimeter, but internally it's not as strong, right? There's a lot of clear text transmission happening. So if, some, if a hacker or even an internal person wants to go in and start misappropriating information or going after it, they have access to all these systems and pretty simply can move from one system to the next. Mm. A lot of people don't realize that Sony had to actually uh, have a HIPAA breach notification because when that, uh, uh, breach happened, they went into the HR system, they were able mm. to pull data that was uh, relevant to healthcare information and that required a breach notification on that. And so, you know, we see that that's one issue companies face. The second is, is that, you know, if I were to go through my top 10 list of customers, they are government contractors, pharmaceutical companies, medical companies, all companies that are heavily regulated and who have a high uh, or maybe a low tolerance right, right. <laughs> for, for security risks. But, you know, in our conversations with them, what they've come back and told us is that when we do our own infosec reviews in our own systems and we start thinking we've got to stand up systems internationally, maybe multiple data centers in the U.S., there's no way that we can staff it and address all the security issues with the rate of change right. that these things are happening at. Um, and they've fully embraced the cloud. Uh, we have customers that um, back up into GovCloud, which is the uh, AWS, uh, specifically right. for U.S. government right. agencies. Teresa right. Carlson's group. Right. And so, um, you know, and you know, we're, we're right at actually, Druva is right at the tail end of being FedRAMP certified as well. So, you know, these are all things that really attest to how strong the security is in the cloud that, uh, you know, everybody's having this confidence. And so it's less of a, an inhibitor. I think where we do occasionally see it is more internationally, right. where companies are still trying to get a feel of cloud and what that means to them. It's, it's just funny to me because there's so many places where, you know, you need to focus on your competitive differentiator and right. you outsource the parts that that are not your core business. And right, how can right. you compete? I mean, James Hamilton's thing on Tuesday night with James Hamilton, which I'm sure you attended, and he just talked about the scale and their their right. networks and laying cable across oceans and you know all these things that you can't do if your core business is selling right. insurance or selling cars exactly. or doing whatever. Right. Well, and there's a difference between you know an infosec team of ten and an infosec team of two thousand. Right. 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 <laughs> it's funny to me. So uh, just another question it, it begs. So you're in the storage business. And you partner with Amazon. Amazon, you know, S3 is like one of their core mm -hmm. products. So how does that how does that work with, with kind of a third party value add service like right. you guys within the context of a cloud provider like an Amazon that's got some of the core basics already? Yeah. So um, best way to understand Druva is, um, you know, what we're doing is we're helping you get your data, consolidating it, and getting insight into that data, right? And so uh, less of just a pure storage. Play. Right. We used we definitely use Amazon Storage. We use S3, S3IA. We use Glacier. Uh, we implement what's called auto tiering. So you're using all that stuff kind of under we your do, covers for your yes, infrastructure, right. right? So it's under you know we look at um, you know best way to think about it is we look at Amazon like an operating system, right? Right. And so the operating system provides some database functionality. It provides it provides storage functionality, memory, right. compute, right. right? And we're optimizing all those things to provide a customer an application that provides the value that right. they're looking for, right. right? Like Amazon can't manage legal holds for, you know, terabytes of data through a, through the legal process. We handle that for customers, right? Okay. Uh, you can't, um, Amazon won't provide compliance monitoring. Like as data's coming into our system, we can look for healthcare 
uh, information. We can look for uh, other sensitive data types, you know, PII, PCI type data. We can then provide alerts and uh, information back to an administrator or a compliance manager about what is there, right? Right. right. And so it's about those insights, um, and that's why you know Druva as a company, why we have done so well. It's uh, you know. Um, we just were funded back in September, for our, our, um, our E-Round, $51 million, uh, led by Sequoia Capital. Um, you know, it's about this idea of, in today's environment, how do you give companies back that insight, that visibility? Um, right. You know, and again, I'll hearken it back to legacy. You know, you go back even, rewind the clock, six years. Most companies would say, oh, I felt really comfortable because everything was fire behind the firewall. So I knew at least where 80% of my data was, right. even if I didn't right. know right. everything about it, at least I had some confidence. Today, that confidence is down to like 20% because it's, well, it could be in Office 365, it could be in Box, it could be in Salesforce, it could be, you know, you name it. Right. Uh, or it could be on somebody's mobile device. Right. right. And if I don't know where it is, that's going to create big issues for me. And I'll uh, talk about... Um, you know, Advocate Healthcare in Illinois that just in August uh, received a $5.5 million fine for HIPAA violation. Largest HIPAA uh, fine ever allocated out to a company, right? And the reason Which is- Which basically means they, expo they exposed. Right, so you know, they had, to, they had to give a breach notification because uh, healthcare data was compromised, right, right? right? And so what companies are starting to realize uh, or experience is that these regulations are becoming tighter there's becoming much more stricter oversight of them. And probably the scariest one for a lot of organizations where there's a lot of question marks is GDPR, which is the new EU kind of a data sensitive data protection regulation that's analogous to HIPAA in the United States, but right. covers the whole EU. And anybody who's doing business in the EU has to know you know, whose data is where, who has it, what the sensitivity is, what the risk is, what the security is on that. And, the, and it's unique in the EU because they have a right to be forgotten clause, which means like, hey, if I call and contact you and I say, I don't want you to have any information about me anymore, you've got to go through and figure out where all that is and expunge it, right? So. It's a real, it's a real challenge. So those are the, you guys deal in those types of problems right. as so well. Right. You know, we're helping companies get those types of problems right, right. solved too. And then there's the availability side. Right. So how do right. you, you know, systems go down? I lose laptops. People leave their device on a train. You know, how do we make sure that data is recoverable? Right. Right. And so we we solve that challenge. And then oh by the way, there's this little thing called big data. Right. And <laughs> IoT. Right, uh, right. And mobile data. That's yeah. Just, it's, it's you guys only have, getting more that complex. Thing just explode. Right. 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 Yeah. It's 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 funny. We do some stuff with with GE, and and you know everybody loves to talk about the airplane engine data, right? When the right. airplane's flying, it gives off so many terabytes, blah blah blah. But you know, as it's crossing international borders in Europe, where's the data supposed to go? I always think right. that's kind of an interesting question with data sovereignty. <laughs> yeah, German it, data, French data, right, Spanish data. Right. right. Um, yeah. yeah. And that, those uh, the sovereignty issues are actually a real big challenge for, right. for a lot of businesses. And you know, we uh, we've talked to a lot of companies. They come to us and say, Hey, you know, we're going into you know, Germany, what do we need to do? And, you know, we, we have some best practices companies should follow, especially when they're thinking about adopting cloud in like Germany, or, you know, we get questions about Russia or China or Singapore, you know, and each one is, I yeah, got its own little nuance. Right. You know, and you have to understand those variations and why the laws were written the way they were. Right. But, you know, to your point, you know, yeah, a plane flying, transmitting data, who knows? Right? <laughs> <laughs> and just to kind of come full circle on, on the AWS show and, and the fact yes, that the sure. enterprises have adopted that. So this brings up the concept of the whole hybrid cloud, right? Because mm -hmm. there's still legacy um, applications, legacy vendors, legacy systems that are still running big mission critical right. applications on-prem. Even if the company itself is doing either used to be test dev, now it's Greenfield Projects starting to migrate historical things to the cloud. Right. How does that change the challenge um, for the folks managing that data and how have you guys kind of seen that evolution impact your business kind of this hybrid cloud notion if you will yeah so you know when we look at hybrid cloud um, you know we fully understand that for the foreseeable future you know enterprises are gonna have a lot of workloads on premises right you know especially real high transaction systems it's it's hard to move those to the cloud there's a lot of legacy right. infrastructure there technology a pesky stacks. thing like the speed of light which is yeah. very slow when yeah exactly right right, <laughs> right. And so you know our our focus has been on you know in our world you can go direct to cloud with everything if you want to, we have, matter of fact, a large portion of our customers, that's all they do is go direct to cloud. Um, we do provide the ability to have caching servers 
uh, which is a, basically a software appliance. Companies can install that on premise. It'll cache locally, uh, so the data doesn't have to go direct to cloud. So you don't have to worry about the latencies and all those other issues. Right, you can do right. recovery directly out of the cache, things like that. So we have ways to address that for those types of environments and those types of systems. One thing we do do, though, that is unique. If you have a very heavy VM environment. Uh, and you want to do disaster recovery, we can take those images and spin them up in the AWS cloud okay. for you as well. So that's a, uh, our Phoenix product actually allows you to uh, take those, um, we convert them automatically into AMIs, you can configure them for failover, um, and then we'll actually push them into customers' AWS accounts. So you get around a lot of the security manageability issues of failover. So it's actually, it's a very kind of elegant way of handling that, migrations, test dev, replication, etc. Okay, so we're coming to the end of our time and, and we're coming to the end of 2016. We're gonna turn the calendar here mm -hmm. in a couple of weeks. As you look forward to 2017, what are some things you're excited about? What do you look forward to? What's kind of on your roadmap for the next 12 months? You know, I guess the things that really kind of get me kind of like get you know passionate about what we do is that I think there's a there's a lot of opportunity to get more from data. That's you know you think about where the cloud if you could massively store a whole enterprise's data set right, what you can actually pull from that you know whether that's uh, through machine learning whether that's digging in search mining. Uh, I think what, what I'm starting to see is something that companies have been trying to solve for years, actually coming to solution, right? right. Um, right. And that's a, and I think between that and some of the new technologies we see kind of evolving and microservices, et cetera, also the cloud becoming even more cost efficient for customers. You know, one of the things you talked about security, the other thing customers uh, typically will talk about is the cost of cloud. Wow, it's too expensive. It's way more than what I would pay for on premise. And um, we try to explain to people is that if you were going with the legacy model that has been retrofitted into the cloud, if you take something that's expensive on premise, you put it on the cloud, it's going to be twice as expensive, right? right? right. That's really what's burned a lot of people. And that's why I really try to advocate, you know, being 100% cloud native stack, uh, you know, we are starting to leverage microservices inside of AWS. It's all about getting, compressing those cost efficiencies to make it more beneficial to customer. I think we're going to see a lot more of that next year where companies start waking up to, wow, this is actually a much more cost effective way for our business. Right, and you can do so much more. Get right. out of that legacy mindset, if exactly. you will. All right, exactly. Dave. Well, thanks for taking a few sure. minutes to uh, to stop by on a on a Friday morning. A little bit of rain in Palo Alto, which we need more, more, more rain. Uh, so he's Dave Packer. I'm Jeff Frick. You're watching the Cube. We'll catch you next time. Thanks for watching. Oh.